hope is a belief that anything is possible or something is possible, specific or it can be in general. So hope is about possibility and it's about not being defeated and not being letting go of your dream or what you want to happen or what you believe should happen. Hi, I'm Kathy Shore. I share hope, I believe in hope, and I hope that you will hope too. Welcome to I Share Hope, the podcast where world leaders share their real stories of hope and how you can use actionable hope to start changing your life today. And now, here's your host, Chris Williams. Can you hear me okay? Yes, very good. Cool. You got any video on your side? Uh, Yes. Is this going on? uh, You're just taping my voice or what? So what we do is release it in a podcast version and a YouTube version because, you know, a lot of folks live on YouTube, not in the podcast world. We just want to make sure we get your story out there the right way. Okay, so there w- it's going to be video, film- video oh. and audio, ideally, yes. If you don't want to do video, we can just simply have a blank screen up with like your picture on YouTube and just playing the audio, but that's not near as fun. It's not as interactive. Okay, and how long is the interview? 20 minutes, 25 okay. maybe, yeah. All right, let me, let me see. You sure you have time now? Yes. No, yep. I changed my plans. Uh, oh, thank you. You didn't have to go to too much trouble. <laughs> no, I forgot that it was um, today. So that's fine. fine. <laughs> Is this okay? Like that's this? great. Yes, you look okay. great. Fantastic. So where are you right now? New York City. That's a great place to be. Not in this weather. <laughs> <laughs> Better than Louisiana right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I have looked at your website. You didn't send us a bio, which is totally cool. In fact, I prefer that sometimes because then I get to discover more on my own. But look at your website, and wow, the pictures that you have there and the way you divide them out. I I want to know about the the album that you've called Shot. Mm -hmm. Is that as in shot? Because one of the people has a huge scar on their chest, and I think, is this gunshot or? Yes. Really? Uh, a shot is, is a, a documentary about shooting survivors in America. Um, 101 survivors of gun violence in America, actually. Wow. Yes. Really? So everybody in the project has been shot. And you took the photos after the shooting, so they're still alive. Thank goodness, yes. Okay. Amazing. And then there's this um, section that's... 9-11, but it's photos leading up to 9-11-2011. And on my website. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you mm-hmm. actually collected, are those your photos day by day? It's literally a photo from every day of the year leading up to the terrorist attacks, right? N- well, no. It's, you're partially right. Okay. Um, what happened is I did a project from uh, September 2000, September uh, 11th, 2010 mm-hmm. through September 11th, 2011, uh, uh, culminating in the 10 year anniversary of nine 11. Gotcha. So what I did is, and this is, I did not use an iPhone. I used a big Canon, uh, 5d camera, which is very heavy. Uh-huh. And I carried that around everywhere I went for the entire year, every day and did a photo a day for the project to kind of get a sense of what happened throughout that year. Wow. Yes. Powerful. So that was, yeah, and it was very, um, I was very proud of myself that um, I had the uh, discipline to do that for the year because it was extreme. With an iPhone, it wouldn't be uh, difficult at all. Right. But with a big camera, wherever you went carrying it, it got to be very uh, tiresome. And you're a, you're a native New Yorker, right? Yes, I am. I was born in Brooklyn. So was it weird feeling like a tourist for a year with carrying this big camera around? <laughs> well, I didn't actually. In that year, I also uh, went to Dubai and uh, uh, Abu Dhabi. So some of the images are from, the, you know, the Middle oh, East. Yeah. Um, and I traveled. Uh, there, there are different places. And wherever I went, my camera went with me. So... It wasn't purely a New York project, although the majority of the pictures are in, in New York City. Mm-hmm. And, and no, um, I don't feel like a tourist in New York City. 
<laughs> I bet you don't. But anybody that I see walking around New York when we visit, if I see a camera hanging around, like, oh, where are you from? You know? That's, that's true. That's true. <laughs> if you, I do a lot of street photography, so that's kind of something that um, you just you don't think of those kind of things because doing working on the street, you have a camera with you. Mm -hmm. And it's one thing if you have a project where you go out and photograph, you know, a day or so, but just the idea of the continuity of something that, um, and actually I'm so happy I did it because I think that's the only year of my life where I know exactly what I did for 365 days. You know how we get into that, oh, was that 2006 or 2007 or eight? I don't remember, blah, blah, blah. This is, I, I mean, I have a, it's like a, writing a diary actually, because it's a, a visual diary of an entire year of your life. Mm. Fantastic. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So Kathy, I see behind you there are some pictures from the limo project, which got so yeah. much uh, just amazing press and coverage. Is that right? Yeah, that was in the uh, international uh, photojournalism show at Pepignon. So that's probably the uh, highest honor, I would think, that a, a documentary photographer can have to be in that show because mm -hmm. it's it's very it's the most well known. So yes. I'm happy. And that project was so much fun. I mean, I drove a limousine. I love to drive. So that was a lot of fun driving this big boat. And um, just the people that I met, because I drove primarily in Brooklyn and, and Manhattan. And uh, it was uh, psychologically interesting because what would happen is when people would get into the car, I was the driver. So I was working for them. Right. But right. After about 20 minutes into the project, I would say, oh, by the way, I'm a photographer and I'm doing a project about people that I drive in the car. Is it okay if I photograph you? So the roles would quickly reverse. And all of a sudden, I was the person that they were trying to please and do anything for. So I no longer was working for them. In essence, they were working for me in their mind. And um, it was really fun to see that happen and also just because someone would have fancy clothes on in the beginning they were very prim and proper but as they time went on and they let their hair down they were the same as if they had jeans on and a t-shirt I mean people were going into delis and fancy dresses and buying six packs of beer and kind of like you know talking like just like they would on the street so it was a uh, it was in, an interesting project to see that sometimes how the power of um, the moment can ch can change on just the you know a, a fact that somebody's doing something that might expose their vulnerability. Mm -hmm. so, uh -huh. But it was great fun driving, and and I and, and the project itself was fun. There's got to be a TED talk somewhere in there where you you study the role reversal process because that's brilliant. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Very true. All right, Kathy Shore, an internationally acclaimed photographer, a, a documentarian. You're just an amazing storyteller and letting us see into people's lives. So you obviously have been picked. We're very careful about who we reach out to. So thank you for saying yes to being part of our, our research project. It's truly a slice of global population. And you're one of a thousand people over the course of 10 years that we'll be interviewing. So. Can I ask you our five questions, and uh, the, you answer them however you want. Okay. Okay. Uh, attempt. I'm going to take a drink of water before I start this. Yeah, I think I'll join you. We we got to get this right. I don't want to don't want to get it wrong here. There is no right answer. I don't. <laughs> no pressure here. <laughs> okay. So question number one: What is your favorite quote about hope, or your definition of hope? However, you would put that in uh, in context. The word hope. Um, well, hope is a belief that uh, anything is possible or something is possible, a specific or it can be a general. So um, hope is about possibility and it's about not being uh, defeated and not being uh, letting go of your dream or what you want to happen or what you believe should happen. So uh, that would be my small definition of hope and um, quotes. It's kind of hard to think of a specific quote about hope, but 
I would say that the song, I Will Survive, that famous Gosh. disco tune, which whenever it comes on, even 20, 25 years later, however long, I guess it was the late 80s that that song came out, I think it brings out the best in anyone that hears it. And I don't think I have ever seen anybody not start whooping and yelling and dancing and getting into the moment of that song. So to me, that's what is, in, is hope and, and pushing yourself and going ahead and not letting anything keep you down is kind of embodied in that song. Hmm. I love that. And I love that song because it's so, you know, some songs make us hopeful, but you end up crying after it's over. But that song, you totally want to just hit the dance floor. And, and yet it's talking about coming through some hard struggles, but you still want to dance. It's so perfect. Yes. And you and also you've survived hmm. because the, the, the tale is of, of somebody being beaten down who the light bulb goes on and says, no, no more. I'm not doing this anymore. So it's a, a victorious um, awakening of someone, and um, very powerful and a, and very fun at the same time. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. So that kind of hope. Tell us about someone. Question two: Who has shared that kind of hope with you in your life? Well, I'm going to talk about the people that I photographed in the project shot because. I, they are the embodiment of hope and perseverance of the human spirit. All of these people have been faced with um, a gun, faced with, faced with being physically injured by a gun, some very seriously, some not as seriously. And the emotional and physical damage that that has done to them and they kind of transcend that. They go through it and they come out the other side. And pretty much everybody in this project of 101 people have said to me, I'm doing this project because if, it, if I can just help one other person, then I'm glad that I did this project. So to me, that idea of going through something very awful and then coming out the other side and then wanting to help people not have to suffer like they did is, I can't, I can't think of anything that's more uh, hopeful and some more courageous and, and the kind of person or people that I want to be surrounded by, people that uh, don't give up and keep going on and are thinking about other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's Good example by those people. Okay, so question three then, Kathy Shore. Take us back to a time in your life where you've needed and used the kind of hope you're talking about. Be that documentarian for us and tell us what was it like and what did you have to do to overcome something that, that really required hope to get through? Well, um, I think that there's probably many times in our lives where we are put in that position where uh, it seems like, what am I going to do? How am I going to figure this out? How can I get to the next point? How can I get through this? And I think one of the most important things is to have people around you that believe in you and can kind of help you stay focused and stay on the path. And sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes you're all alone with your feelings and you're all alone with that belief. And then something inside of you has to be the, the, the force that keeps you going. And I think that sometimes in your life it can be that you have people cheering you on or telling you, go, you can do it. And then there are other times where you're in this dark place that you have to come up with this hope and, and push to get through it and move on. And you have to believe in yourself. I think that that's the thing that um, makes hope possible, is to believe that it's going to be all right, you're going to get through this, and if it doesn't work out that exact way that you want it to, that's okay. Something better will happen. And really, it is that idea of 
uh, we talked about quotes before, and I couldn't come up with a quote on the spot, but there is that idea of the one door closing, another door opening in part of this too. And I think that you have to, as long as you believe that you're going to be okay, that you're going to get through this, that sometimes you have to close the door to open the other one. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I mean, for me, I guess, uh, I guess when I got divorced, I kind of felt like, Oh, now what am I going to do? I'm, and I was in school at the time and I had two little children and I thought, uh Oh, uh, am I going to have to quit school to, uh, to work or to, to get through this or how am I going to manage school and little children and everything? And I think if you have an end goal that you can kind of pretty much do anything in the, in the interim to go towards the goal. So, I remember that I needed uh, for my tuition, I think it was another $200 a month. And I had to have a, a job only on a Sunday. It was very specific because I had my children and it had to be on Sunday, a job on Sunday where in the course of a month I would be able to make this amount of money. And I found a job that was, I mean, it was a terrible job. I had to sell shoes on Sunday to... Uh, a clientele that was not the best clientele. It was a kind of a, uh, a it, it reminded me of drug dealers' girlfriends, basically, that were coming into this. <laughs> it's descriptive. <laughs> and it was not a ple it was not pleasant at all. And I despised the the whole Sunday was my day from hell. And but I had the silver lining. I knew that if I did this, I would have my tuition for the rest of the year. And I think it was about six, I think I did it from January to June. And every Sunday I got up and I was like, oh, no, but I knew that I, what my, um, um, why I was doing it so I could do it. And I think that that's kind of something that's important. If you have to do something that you don't like, Make sure that you know what you're doing it for. Make sure that you have a goal at the end of it. And then I think it's pretty, um, it, it, it's, it's, you're, we're, we as human beings are able to do a lot if we have a goal and uh, something, hope to get to, at the, you know, to get through this kind of torturous, whether it's a job, whether it's being nice to somebody that you don't really like. Whatever it is, you, it, it's much easier to do when you have a goal and focus. Well done. Congratulations on your life, and thank you for sharing a small little piece. I know, I know that's not been your only bad day, and I know it's not been your only good day getting through it. It's life, you know, and you're doing good. Yes. Thank you. All right. All right. Question four. How are mm -hmm. you sharing hope with people today? Obviously, your art is amazing. Walk us through what it's like for you to share hope on a day-in, day-out basis. Well, one of the things that I um, do with photography is that I teach uh, photography to marginalized groups of people who uh, it then becomes a force and an outlet for the change in their own lives. So I have taught um, in the New York public schools, suspended high school students, I have taught um, at the gay men's uh, health crisis, at-risk gay young men, convicted felons young men at the Fortune Society. Um, I also taught a uh, class with seniors at the uh, a China, Chinatown um, Senior Center. So all these, um, and photography is a, a great means of having people get a sense of themselves and their community. So that to me is one of my favorite ways to, um, to see the transformation of people who when they take a camera and they start looking at their life or um, looking at their community, how they really change and then empowering them even further by teaching computer skills on how to work with images in the computer. So that's... Uh, I think uh, uh, as an artist, I think we can teach others how to communicate through art. 
And I think that that is extremely empowering and also opens up um, new worlds for people who kind of have been put in these boxes where they're told that they can't really uh, experiment or be something other than who they think they are. Good point. Good point. Great point. I'm glad you're bringing all that up. I think art's is a phenomenal way to communicate and instill real life-giving passion. There's something to art. I don't know what it is. It's not just am I passionate about art, but there's something to it that actually seems to create energy. I, I don't know another way to explain it. That's I'm not a scientist, but that's it's there, you know? Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay, question five. How, uh, can you hear me okay still? I can okay, how do we share hope today? So we're going to hang up this call, and those of us listening in on a podcast or watching on YouTube, we're going to go our own way in a few minutes. What do we do next? I'm going to walk away from here to share hope with somebody else or, or build hope in myself. Well, I think uh, we can start talking and listening to each other and work small think small about this and, and kind of look to see who you can help within your own sphere. And that could be working and volunteering at a school. It could be teaching, you know, the big brother, big sister programs with, for kids that don't have um, people that they can talk with or go out with or enjoy. I think volunteering and trying to help people who you might be able to just listen to or just walk with and talk with is a really good way to uh, get hopeful again. Mm -hmm. Because I'm pretty sure that when you go into those kind of circumstances, I know for me, you always come out feeling better because even if you think your life was so terrible when you walked in, when you walk out, I think you feel like, damn, I'm, I'm really lucky, you know, I, I shouldn't be complaining about this. There, there are people that are really going through tough times, and, uh, you know, my, uh, my problems are not that, that overwhelming that I can't deal with. Them. That's really good advice. Thank you. Thank you. So, Kathy, how do we keep up with you? I know that when I just Google your name, Kathy Shore, that which is S H O R R, so K A T H Y S H O R R. Kathy, I'm not telling you that, you know how to spell your name. But for everybody else listening, Google that, you'll find Kathy's website. Is there anywhere else, social media, blogs, whatever, anything else we should be paying attention to to follow what you're doing? No, I think the website, I have the, um, the shot project is uh, shotproject.org, and the book is coming out in the spring of 2017. Powerhouse Books is doing the book, and I'm really excited about that. So if people have an interest in uh, seeing 101 survivors from across the USA, from all races, many ethnicities, ages 8 to 80, from high and low profile shootings, and for the most part, the survivors were photographed where they were shot. So that adds this other element to the project. Wow. And um, we also have gun owners as well as an NRA member in the project. So it's not about taking people's guns away. It's about talking about and seeing what we have in common. And that gun violence really affects all Americans. And that we have to talk about it rather than scream at each other hysterically about um, not, you know, not making change, not making things happen just talking and not listening. Mm. So you're taking people back to the place they were shot. What is the trauma? Now, is there any PTSD that you run into there? People getting a little nervous and freaking out about being there again? Well, for the most part, uh, people are really, there's a closure to it, and people are really happy about um, coming full circle. It, but it's a, very, it's a complicated project because some people are shot in their home or their car, so they go back immediately. Sure. You know, it's not like that. And then there are other people who choose to go back that don't have to go back but want to go back. And some people, it's in, in their neighborhood. It's very um, 
specific to the survivor. Uh, interestingly enough, I had one situation where I was in Miami and I was scheduled to photograph a woman whose uh, fiance had shot her. And the night before I was supposed to photograph her, she emailed me and said, I went back to the place last night and I can't do it. I just can't do it. Wow. It freaked me out. So the next year, I, I was fine. I mean, I'm sorry that that happened. That was the first person that said that. But the next year when I went back to Miami again, I emailed her and I said, I'm coming back. Are you interested in trying this time? And she said, yes. And we went back and she came with her little son and it was her, her old apartment complex where they lived. And she did the photograph and she did it with her son and she was ready then, you know, she had avoided that place for a long time, and then that first reaction, she was really um, upset about being there, but she made peace with it, and she went back and reclaimed the space. So that was probably the, um, I think that was the only person that uh, said that she they couldn't go to the place, and then she, she came back and did it. So. Wow. wow. That's a, yeah. cool to be part of the healing process and to actually see a change in somebody like that. It was very, it, I felt really good about that, I because I felt terrible actually when she told me she went there and she freaked out and she couldn't do it. I felt like I had kind of put her in a position to do something that she wasn't ready for. So it was really good to know that she, um, she went through that. Mm, that is sweet. That really is. Okay, so at the beginning of our podcast, and... Those who watch the YouTube get to see all this fun backstage stuff. But at the beginning of the podcast, we let each guest introduce themselves. So I'll be quiet for a second. Will you give us an audio clip? Let's I, I'm Kathy Shore, and I share hope. Or I'm Kathy Shore, uh, documentarian, photographer, awesome person, and I share hope. Whatever you want to say about yourself. <laughs> get closer to the mic, too. I need some really good audio for this. All right, all right. Tell me when I'm ready. You're, you're good. I'll be quiet. Okay. Hi, I'm Kathy Shore. I share hope. I believe in hope. And I hope that you will hope, too. I like that. That's really great. Good for you. Okay. So I have, I have a 14-year-old who loves photography. She's so creative. Such a good artist. And, and of course, and I have an iPhone. And um, she has a Polaroid camera, though. Oh, okay. So what can I go home and I, when I go home and tell her, I talked to this photographer who's legit today, and she said, here's the secret to getting awesome pictures. What do I tell her? Okay, well, if she really wants to do photography as, a, as something that's, are we, are we, we're talking just talking now, right? But this is not part of the podcast, or is it? No, this is, I mean, sure, the people on YouTube are welcome to watch this. Maybe they'll get something awesome out of it, but... But what, do, but what do we do? This is, yeah, what do we do? All right, well, of course you have to practice and keep taking photographs and kind of uh, a good idea to talk to people that are in the field to kind of get a sense of what you may be doing wrong, what, what the, to, to kind of help you understand your direction. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that um, is really important in photography is about having a project or something that people can relate to you. Ah. Because many people won't know my name, but if somebody says, you know that project about the shooting survivors, uh, 101 people from across America, they'll remember that and not my name. So I was given this advice when I went to um, I went to the School of Visual Arts in New York City for photography and we had um, a guest speaker one day and he told us that um, and he was a successful commercial photographer and he said that you should always have your name associated with a project that's successful in the sense that it's unique and people will remember the project because they're not going to remember your name but they will remember that project that you did mm -hmm. and I think that was really good advice because um, mm -hmm. I myself can see that I, I 
in my mind's eye, I can see certain images that have have been part of uh, somebody somebody's body of work, but I don't remember the photographer necessarily, but I do remember the body of work. So I would say that um, she should try to have people look at her work, get constructive critique from it, what people are liking, what they're not liking, listen to what people have to say, and then as she gets further on, to come up with an idea, and it could be, the idea could be a street in your neighborhood that she just works on in photographs. Or if she likes to do uh, landscapes and stuff, maybe landscapes that have, you know, dogs in it or something. So, you know, so a specific idea and then to kind of stay with it and kind of try to get maybe 20 good images about that subject and then put that out there. That's good advice. I, I was expecting you to say, hold the camera this way and make sure the lighting comes from the left or something like that. That's good advice. That really is. Didn't that see that. Actual advice you can get from uh, anyone. It's, it's much easier to be technically right than it is to be creatively right. I mean, if you, get to, if you have your creativity going, you can learn techniques like that, you know, from tutorials online. But you can't really learn creativity, you know, that that's something that you can have the most expensive equipment and technically know what you're doing, but your images can be very flat and not interesting. So it's much more important for her to be creative and her photos might, don't have to be even in focus. She could have blurry imagery that's beautiful, but um, creativity is not something that you can learn, really. I got it. You're a genius at this, obviously. The wall behind you tells that story right away. <laughs> but I've uh, been doing it a while, so kind of have learned from my mistakes. <laughs> well, you've learned well. Okay, so anybody who's listening or watching, if you didn't get websites, the, the place where you can go find the project, like the shot project, if you go to I Share Hope, if you're out shopping or running, whatever you're doing when you're listening, go to I Share Hope later. Look on the interviews, click on the tab that says interviews, and look for Kathy Shore's name, and we will have her photo, some of her links, anything about this interview and anything about her work that we can put on there to point you towards her will be right there. Ishorehope.com, Kathy Shore, and you will find all of this, and you'll find Kathy. Not that she's hard to find. Okay, okay <laughs> Kathy Shore. Um, I'm not going to pass up an opportunity to get a selfie with, oh, with a world-renowned photographer. So here's, here's the best thing I can think of. I'm going to hold. All right, we're going to do this selfie style, right? So You're going to do whatever you need to there do. There it is right there. Scoot up a little bit. <laughs> this is, is this a Skype selfie? Is that what we call this? I guess this is, uh, a, yeah, an SS. An SS. All right, you ready? One, two, three. We got it. All right. That's interesting. Now, that just proves that I'm a creative genius too, right? Or a stupid one, one of the two. <laughs> All right, Kathy. It's been so much fun. Thank, Thank you for adjusting your schedule. I know it was tight tonight. No, no, that's fine. And it was much easier than I thought. I was stressing about those oh. questions, so I decided not to read them. But uh... <laughs> Well, you did really good. If these weren't even rehearsed, I'm super impressed. No, nothing was rehearsed. Because sometimes if you try to, re for me to rehearse, I get nervous. So I had to go off the top of my head. Yes. I think that's the greatest thing about, honestly, your images and these kind of interviews. It's just real life, you know? Yeah. It's, it's like, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll wing it. I can't memorize the question. Perfect. You did awesome. Thank, Thank you very much. You. Thank you so much, Chris. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. You've just listened to I Share Hope. If you're ready to make a change, head to our website at ishareHope.com and claim your free copy of the top 10 actions of hope from world leaders to use hope in your own life. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.